Good evening, gospel revolutionaries around this whole world. Welcome here to the Room of Rooms. Lovingly and affectionately called. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I hope you're enjoying the conference. Many of you already have. Uh, at this point, we have about 100, just on YouTube, we have approximately 100 new viewers every day. 100 viewers a day. So uh, that is, at this point, just on YouTube, we have had 400 people attending the conference. That doesn't count all the other platforms that this is being broadcast on. So we want to encourage you, especially those of you that would take the time to watch this Tuesday night video about the success of this conference. Uh, some of you have made it part way through. Some of you have made it all the way through. And uh, the reactions we're getting are really uh, just exactly what we thought they would be. And uh, as this begins to absorb into the consciousness of people around this planet, you're going to see some very strong impacts. Uh, the misplacement of the 1,000 year uh, reign of Christ, it has been misplaced for 2,000 years. That's a long time for something a thousand years long to be misplaced. It's been uh, misplaced for 2,000 years and it's 2,000 year misplacement has created uh, uh, 46,000 denominations around the world. I made the statement during the conference, I'm really surprised after looking into the variations that come uh, that can come out of not understanding the thousand year reign. And I'm really surprised it's not more uh, around 200,000 denominations, which probably in all reality, there very well may be that many uh, without the ability to make the distinctions uh, clearly between them. Uh, the thousand year reign, goodness, uh, we gave you six hours of our best and uh, I've listened to it now. I'm in my third go through. Uh, so uh, it is, uh, it's amazing the things that it helps the mind think through about the gospel. I've been talking to you about the subject of knowledge on uh, these Tuesday nights, and we're going to continue that this evening. Um, there's uh, something about uh, these verses that I want to cover this evening in Romans chapter 11 about the knowledge of God that Paul zeroed in on. I will never be able to exhaust the effect that Paul intended to have on the subjects of belief and personal faith and calling on the name of the Lord to get saved. And uh, Paul's mission in this writing to Peter's church in Rome, which is still there today, according to the Catholics, was his attempt to uh, help people who had been incorrectly indoctrinated to believe that the thousand year reign of Christ was something yet to come. Uh, because there was a great disappointment amongst the Gentiles, I'm sorry, amongst the disciples. Disciples are now Gentiles, I guess, in my mind. Uh, but amongst the disciples, there was great disappointment and uh, disillusionment and uh, confusion uh, after the death, burial, and the resurrection. Uh, because they were still emphatically believing that a kingdom was coming to this earth. Well, we've had 2,024 years, and in the understanding that uh, Jesus was presenting, that kingdom was right here already. And he was saying it is just here. It's at the door. It's, it's at hand. Uh, speaking of his own ministry and his own work that would bring forth that kingdom. I'm still just rolling you know, over in my own mind this powerful encounter that Jesus had with the uh, mother uh, of John and James. <coughs> Excuse me. This encounter <coughs> with the mother of John and James where that she was asking for, oddly enough, for her sons to be able to sit at the right and the left. I'm not going to go through all of that again. 
But uh, obviously, that's one of the places right before the crucifixion, they were very much fixated on their new kingdom that was coming to destroy the Roman Empire and set up the kingdom of God, which they, of course, would be very important people in. Uh, and uh, Jesus uh, told them, he said, you know, if you're looking for a position, uh, we really, I, re I want to let you know what the positions are that are open. And this is the high, this is as high as it goes, guys. <laughs> he said, this is not going to happen like you've seen amongst the Gentiles and actually the way they had seen amongst the Jews also of a hierarchy. He said, that's not what it's going to be. In this kingdom, there's two positions open, and that's servant and slave. Now, that was not imposed slavery. That is chosen slavery to serve others. The mind of Christ that uh, we spoke to you about in our last session, the power of understanding that Jesus Christ, Yeshua Christ himself, being here as God, finding himself uh, in the form of God, and uh, he did not have to struggle or grasp for that to find himself. He just found himself in that position. And he also found himself in the position as a man. It said that in that, this mind that was in him, that while he was God, that he did not count uh uh, equality with God, something that had to be grasped for, obviously, because he was born that way. You're that way the, for the very same reason, recapping just a bit from last week. And also that he did not exploit the fact that he was God. We're being uh, as aggressive with this as we can. We hope that Don's proud of us, uh, that you are God in the earth. And that is the greatest knowledge that this planet will ever have and the greatest responsibility for that knowledge is with lies within each and every individual. Only the understanding of you being God in the earth is going to give you the power to choose to serve and also the choice not to exploit that position because that's where the power comes is when the position is not exploited and you use the position to actually serve. There's such power in that. And we we could go through thousands and thousands of stories to show you where that many, to, many of you in your own lives, you've experienced this. There's a great power in that. Uh, so uh, this, this uh, term about the mind of Christ shows up again about having knowledge. So we're going to touch on that uh, here once again in uh, Romans chapter 11. These, uh, again, of course, this is in the book of Romans, and uh, Paul has gone through his doxology. My goodness, the euphoria that Paul had once he uh, brought the reality of the conclusion of all in unbelief so that God could have mercy upon all. And uh, it's just been very interesting to examine that and go back and look and see that this is where it's written is as important as what was written. This was written to people who were being trained and taught by Peter that you must believe. Peter had a very good reason to teach that because the book of John is uh, is uh, thick with it over 90 times, the instruction to believe. However, even if you read the end of John uh, chapter 12, at least get to chapter 12, then it explains that, but nobody believed. Why? Because it was not God's plan to bring salvation through belief or salvation through personal faith. Uh, Paul's going to touch on that again here in chapter 11 to make sure that you're not confused about this issue of personal belief or faith having any part of salvation of the human race or the collective nature of that salvation. And he, he begins this here in this last part of Romans chapter 11. And he says, for I would not, brethren, have you that you should be ignorant. And uh, that word ignorant means uh, exactly that. It means to ignore. Uh, don't ignore this mystery because it, you see, uh, 
if uh, he didn't say, I don't want you to be stupid because stupid comes from the word stupor, which means the inability to know. Ignorant is means that you know you are in a position to know, you're just ignoring the facts. <clears throat> and what Christianity has done for 2,000 years is simply ignore the knowledge. They've ignored the fact and uh, the facts of the totality of the uh, uh, power of where God has deposited himself by purpose from before, purposed before the foundations of the world. This is some good preaching here going on. And he said, I don't want you to be ignorant of the mystery, uh, uh, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. Now, Paul said that the, the lack of knowledge of this salvation that he is speaking of to the Romans, he said, it's going to cause you to become real wise in your own conceits. So what is wisdom in your own conceit? It's called 46,000 denominations. That's wise in your own conceits. That's being wise about what role you play. And if you understand the mystery of the gospel, which is no longer a mystery, you'll know that you play no role in this part. It's just don't be ignorant of it. Don't ignore it. Don't ignore the thing that is already manifestly uh, been made uh, the reality. This is not an, uh, something that you can have if you're aware of it. It's yours, whether you know about it or not. It's just, just please Paul is pleading with all of us not to be ignorant of the facts. He said uh, that uh, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. So he's going back to exactly what is stated in the book of John, that the blindness to the reality of this mystery uh, uh, in, in part came upon them for one reason, it was the blindness wasn't in part, the blindness was total. But what he's referring to is in part, the reason was that the blindness came was so that God could include the Gentiles. You know, no Jew was gonna accept any Gentiles in any plan of God. So God blinded them in part because of that plan, because uh, God's plan uh, included the entire human race. And at the time, there were only two groups of people in God's economy, and that was Jew or Gentile. You, if you were a Jew, you were not a Gentile. If you were a Gentile, you were not a Jew. It didn't break down into any other subsets other than that. And uh, he, uh, he said, without this knowledge, he said, it's going to make you wise in your own conceits. And then in verse 26 says, and so all of uh, all Israel and here, once again, we have to expose this translation, uh, shall be saved. So that's not what this verse says. And so this is what the Greek says. And, kea, so, hauto, all, pas, Israel, Israel, sozo. And so all Israel saved. Now, <laughs> That just tickles me. I don't know about you, but uh, this is not a shall be. But you, why did they add shall be? Because it fit their perspective of a future coming kingdom. It all makes so much sense now. They did not uh, accept that the thousand year reign of Christ ended with the resurrection. They were embracing what Apollos had taught and Peter had taught that uh, that this started at the resurrection, and that is not what the uh, scriptures teach. And I'm not going to reteach the uh, conference for you, but I do encourage you to go back and listen many times. It's just too revolutionary to be able to absorb all of it in once. I'm I'm listening to it myself over and over again so that I can get it. And so all Israel saved, as it is written. Uh, and this is a prophecy, so this is in here correctly, and this is a quote out of Isaiah 59, 20. There shall come out of Zion a deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Now, 
this was a prophecy, so this has already happened. The interesting thing about this prophecy is most all of the instructions was to turn people away from ungodliness. And the word turn away here simply means to separate. Now, uh, and uh, how many, gosh, we could just come up with hundreds of verses about God telling people to come out of sin, separate yourself from sin, take yourself out of this, get out of, get out of Dodge, get out of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, leave it all behind, leave it on the table, separate yourselves. But this, is, this was not the plan of God. Folks, this is so beautiful. The, uh, what, what Isaiah said here was that God was going to, uh, 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 and it's, uh, the term, uh, here, uh, means to, uh, separate. <laughs> that God was going to separate ungodliness from Jacob. First time, I can't find any other place. Now, it's quoted here, but it's quoted accurately from Isaiah, and it's also some mentioned toward this uh, in uh, Psalms chapter 14, verse 7. But Isaiah 59, 20 is where I believe this quote comes from. And uh, it's important to know that the thing about this covenant was not that God was trying to get people out of sin, God said, this time I'm going to get the sin out of the people. Now, if you just, let's let's turn back and say we didn't teach on the Antichrist doctrines of Pentecostalism. Let's just all go Pentecostal. Let's dance. Let's swing from the chandeliers. Folks, this is so powerful. And even the mistranslations about the temple that uh, if anyone uh, 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 spoils the temple, or does anything to defile the temple, God will destroy that temple. Well, Daniel and I, we've got it in our little translation right here. This is beautiful. You need it, need it, need it, need it. Um, that That is not what that says, that it actually says that uh, that God would destroy everything out of the temple, not the temple. And here, once again, we find that even the prophecy was not that he was going to get Jacob out of sin. He was going to get the sin out of Jacob. Mm -mm. This is just too good at knowledge. This is knowledge, knowledge, because it's already happened. Why is it knowledge? Because it's already happened. For this is my covenant unto them uh, when I shall take away their sins. And once again, and the term uh, shall is not here. For this is my covenant with them when separation of sin from them takes place. Mm. The separation of sin from the people. It's, it, it, it is the center of focus. I mean, <laughs> uh, turn the kaleidoscope. Stop trying to get out of sin because God got the sin out of us. And uh, this is this powerful mystery, and the knowledge of it will transform this human race. As concerning the gospel, uh, let me make sure I read the rest of that. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. Now, uh, he said that people that are, are not uh, viewing this this way, they are enemies of the gospel. Uh, these 46,000 de denominations, folks, they are enemies of the gospel. Anyone that's still trying to get people out of sin instead of preaching that God got the sin out of people, they are enemies of the gospel. Mm. Uh, four, uh, plural, unnecessary, for the gift and the calling of God is without repentance. There is no changing of mind. Now, we showed you the last time where God has changed his mind. Uh, that was one of the sessions I did uh, last month. 
about God changing his mind and how important it was that he did. And even the baptism of repentance, that was God's baptism uh, of him changing his mind. Also, it's a very powerful thing. But the, the gift of this righteousness, the gift of righteousness and the calling of God is without change of mind. This is one place that you can hang your hat and say, God's not going to change his mind because uh, Paul teaches us that very clearly. For as ye in time past have not believed God and ye have now obtained mercy. So he said, <laughs> your, your unbelief led to mercy. This was Paul's euphoria. Uh, uh, through their unbelief. He said that uh, this has led in times past have not believed God yet uh, have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. Uh, the centerpiece of this is not getting man out of sin. It's getting sin out of man and not by man believing but by God believing, what's the difference between God believing in the issue of salvation and man and believing? When man tries to believe, he's trying to get sin out of him and, and righteousness to be clung to him, to say, here's a present you can hold on to. But you see, when God does it, it doesn't get man out of sin. It gets sin out of man kind, the entire world, and doesn't just give us an imputed righteousness, which is what uh, Paul agreed with and tries to uh, dismantle uh, throughout this book also, is that we are not people who have been imputed with righteousness. We've been made righteous. And this is such a powerful difference. And here these differences between the last covenant and this covenant and this is what this is all about. And Paul is saying, you really need to have this knowledge. Even so, have these also now not believed that through your mercy, they also shall, uh, they also may obtain mercy. And the term may is not here. It is through uh, your, uh, your mercy, through that mercy also, uh, they obtain mercy, not shall. This is something that's already taken place. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. And then, of course, Paul's uh, uh, great euphoria, uh, his doxology here. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. So what is this? What is getting sin out of man instead of getting man out of sin? What is this getting, uh, turning man into righteousness instead of giving him a gift uh, through his faith? What is this transformation that uh, instead of belief leading to righteousness, the gift that can't be taken back, the, the imputation, I'll say it right, the uh, God... Uh, uh, literally making us his righteousness, that is nothing that's ever going to be reversed whatsoever. Uh, how unsearchable. I'm going to read the first part of that again because it's just too good. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. Folks, this is the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Paul's just simply saying that no matter how long you study this, you'll never get to the bottom of it. Oh, but are we ever swimming in it, right? <laughs> Verse 34, for who hath known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? And uh, then Paul says in verse 35, or who has first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again. This is the verse that got me in trouble 35 years ago. And I stood up in Bob Yandian's church uh, for one of them. And um, uh, I taught this and uh, 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 brought out this verse that God said, uh, Paul taught that nobody has ever given to God first and man has received something because of what he gave to God. 
I went through the list of all my word of faith doctrines and said, you've never done this first and God responded to you. And that is what caused Marilyn Hickey to go on a rampage against me. It caused Bob Yandian to go on a rampage against me. Uh, it caused uh, it caused a hell of a whole lot of problems. <laughs> because word of faith doctrine in verse 35, word of faith doctrine or any Christian doctrine that says if you tithe, if you give, or if you pray, if you do this, God will respond. And uh, Paul's challenge to this these 46,000 denominations is who's ever first given to him that he was in a position to obligate, uh, be obligated to repay or to respond to that. Now, we taught very specifically in the Word of Faith movement that, and Kenneth Copeland does it to this day, all of them do. The Jesse Duplantis's, all this garbage out there. They would, you know, I command you, Lord. It's like, ah, <laughs> I used to do that. Uh, and the term, uh, well, the verse they take it out of says, command ye me concerning the works of my hand. And I dare you to go back and look at it. And the list is about, were you there when I created the worlds? Were you there when I filled up the oceans? Were you there when I brought the mountains up out of the sea? Were you there? <clears throat> and then the translators continued and just put a period. Uh, uh, it's a question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. And then it says, command ye me concerning the works of my hands. <laughs> Except they didn't continue with the question marks. They put a period there and it created the word of faith doctrine and uh, uh, a great ignorance. What is the word of faith doctrine? It is ignorance. It is ignoring, ignoring the fact that God is the one who separated the sin from man, not man separating himself from sin. You don't need the sermon taught to you all over again. For of him and through him and to him are all. Now, the, th the term things is not here. Thus, there's so many places it just seems to be a, a, a deliberate need to try to splatter this understanding. We don't want them to think it's all. Let's do all things. That way we divert the attention away from this all business that everybody's included. Well, we found you out and we're teaching it the way that it is written. And uh, it says, uh, for of him and through him and to him are all. Now, in fact, the word R is italicized. This is the way it actually reads. If I'm going to be nitpicky, might as well do it all the way, right? For of him and through him and to him all. <laughs> of him, to him, through him, all. To whom be glory, to whom, and it's not even be, to whom glory forever Amen. And that is, there's no better place for an amen than right there. Uh, folks, this is the knowledge of God. This is the powerful knowledge of God. And we want you to not be ignorant of this. There's no need for this ignorance anymore. It has infected 46,000 denominations and uh, no one needs to be that ignorant. No one needs to be that ignorant. You're smarter than that. You're better than that. Enjoy the fact that God separated sin from you. God didn't give you righteousness. He made you righteous. <laughs>